Hi, I'm Dean Anderson, and I'm here with my good friend Daryl Connor. Daryl's, um, geez, somebody I've known for 20 years, and somebody I've looked up to every minute of those 20 years. Um, Daryl is the chairman of Connor's Partners, author of a couple fantastic books, Managing at the Speed of Change and Leading at the Edge of Chaos. Um, it's a treat to hang out with you for some time. <laughs> And we're going to talk about um, the future of the field and where the field of change is going and where it's been. Daryl's been a practitioner and a, a leader and a thought leader in this space for all this time, even longer than that. I won't go back all the way to the early times, but for a number of decades. And I'd love to explore where we're each seeing that the field of change is going, where we think the field of change management needs to evolve to. Maybe we go there a little bit. Love to talk to you about your current work and your excitement around building change practitioners that can really take organizations, you know, to breakthrough level results and, and take the field forward as well. So, welcome. Thank you. I've been yeah. looking forward to this. Yeah, good. And I would love to start maybe just to get a little kind of grounding in our current reality of, um, you know, being that you've seen this field for so long. You know, and you and Linda, I, I hold you as a grandma and a grandpa change management. I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're each a couple years older than me, so I can be the young punk kid. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> um, but you don't I, you don't do as you're told very well. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> um, but I would love to start with how, just in a snapshot, what has changed in the last twenty or thirty years? How is it different? It really creates context for people that are maybe new to this field. Oh, uh, wow, okay. Um, so this is, the, this is the 40th year of the practice for me. So when I go back and I think about what's changed, one thing is that um, there, there wasn't, there, it wasn't just that there was not a profession. Change itself wasn't discussed. Mm -hmm. So it was trying to, even, in those days, it was even trying to have a conversation about that. Um, maybe with somebody like Linda, fine, but an executive, much less pay you for it. It, it, was, it was very, it wasn't even academic, it was esoteric. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Today, um, both good and bad, uh, I'll speak to both sides, it's very much mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, much more here that in, in Europe it's not so mainstream. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to tuck change management underneath project management more there. But here it's it's actually kind of unusual if you don't have some change management mm -hmm. stuff going on. Yeah, here in North America. Here in North America. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's got some wonderful benefits. It also, I think, has generated a um, uh, a mindset of for for mass consumption. Mm -hmm. So what that means for me is that I think it's it change management in its expansion and acceptance mm -hmm. has, has moved to a lower common denominator mm -hmm. than I think it has the potential for. So it's so that anything that gets this popular has got to trade off, right? So I think as the profession has kind of traded itself off a bit. Yeah. But, you know, on the plus side, um, there's good work being done, and, and it's a legitimate profession now. Um, so that's one thing that's different. Um, Dean, the corollary to all that is how different the clients are. Yeah. I mean, I'm just grateful to be working with leaders that are they're as serious about their change as I am about my profession, and getting to dance together is, it's, it's, it's just wonderful, it's wonderful. And I, I attribute that to scar tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the leaders I work with have, they, they didn't just have some insight, they got burned pretty bad, right. or, or watched somebody get burned pretty bad, and they said, oh, okay, <laughs> I don't know what that change stuff is, but I, I better find out about it. And so, um, so there's a, a maturity mm -hmm. to, the, to the leaders themselves. Um, and. Thank goodness, because something else has changed is the, is the complexity of the issues. I mean, you know, I, I used to think um, re-engineering was really a complex <laughs> issue, right? Well, bring me three or four of those yeah. on any given day now. So, so the phenomenon is evolving. Yeah. 
um, and and thank goodness there's leaders who are taking it seriously and the and the the profession is moving forward. Um, what else would I see is 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 different? Um, well, okay. In the beginning, um, Linda and I would be examples of people heavily invested in in not just trying to figure out the phenomenon, but tools and techniques and and for a long time having methodology was a huge differentiator right. and 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 now i mean it's it's just table stakes yeah. you, you know you have to have it. Every, everybody in fact most practitioners are probably certified in two or three methodologies yeah. that and that's that's certainly something that's different and i that's got pluses and minuses but i generally see that as a plus yeah. that cuz i I don't think anybody's, uh, in, including you and I, we both have our methodologies. I don't think anybody's nailed it, but everybody's kind of pushed the edge a little further in one area, and so the collectively the profession I think is 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 advancing, and that's good. Yeah, well, I love the way you frame this that there's both you know the good news and the bad news about the field of change becoming a legitimate field, and the way I'm hearing you. Um, is that in some ways it's been commoditized, right? And the quality maybe of a center of gravity of thinking in the mass has naturally migrated to the people that are young to the field, that are new to the field, that are trying to get certified in different people's tools and, and techniques, and then adopting the mindset that what they're certified in is actually the answer. And then, yes. there, then there's, and the good news in that is that it's, there's actually a conversation. You know, like you say, 30, 35 years ago, we had a difficult time having that conversation with leaders. And, and, and so that's the good news. And there's also, I think, a good news and the bad news of that, which is, like you say, that a lot of the leaders, because they've had scar tissue, they're actually in some ways seeing beyond the field, right? At least the visionary leaders. Yeah. And they're saying, well, we need a change management department, but we also need something that's more strategic that pushes the edge of the enterprise execution Absolutely. on its strategy. And I know your frame on change is strategy execution, which I love because all change is in fact that if it's aligned to what the purpose the, uh, that, that the market's calling out for the organization, it's got to be aligned to strategy. Yeah. So I'd love to explore that. So if that's kind of the hist you know, just a snapshot of the history, I think really well said, um, the way you describe that, where do we see it going? Like what's needed? You know, you've You've already stated that the complexity is, is larger, right? Leaders, they have the scar tissue, they're leaning into the question, how do we handle this change stuff? The complexity of the problems are larger. Where do you think the practitioners need to go? Where, where are the edges there? Uh, so one edge for me that I, I hope we can make some gains on is, um, well, first of all, the one thing I would add to what you just said, because it'll be a platform for some other things for us, is that with that, with commoditizing the the profession, uh, I think that we, the profession has gravitated toward technicians mm -hmm. instead of. One of my fears, concerns, is that new new professionals coming in now, uh, they're they're not they're not being shown a continuum, right. they're being shown. A, tech, a methodology, and and not only told that's that's all there is, but there's there's not a chance to develop mastery, mm -hmm. um, and so my my hope in this we can talk about this in terms of where we're going professionally is that we have more of a sense of con, of a continuum, and there's nothing wrong with spending a whole career on on the tactical end of change management. It's wonderful, good work, but there is a continuum here, and and. And mastery would require more than just the technical part. So, with that kind of framing, one of the areas that I'm really intrigued with is is the impact that neuroscience is going to have on our profession. And and I have to say that at this point, I'm disappointed in what has emerged. Uh, when neuroscience has now been the new silver bullet for I don't know maybe three or four years. Mm -hmm. And it's it's gained a lot of popularity, and I I was among those early rush in there because I just thought, oh my gosh, this new. One of the things I I think is true about mastery is that 
when you pursue a mastery level, you're borrowing from other disciplines. You're not just staying on your own track. And I thought, wow, what a cool discipline to borrow from. And I still believe that it is going to be. But honestly, right now, there's been, from my standpoint, m more hype than substance. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be very clear, because I think some really solid stuff has come out of uh, neuroscience about explaining to us what is taking place in our brains as change occurs. Mm -hmm. Wonderful stuff. As a practitioner, I don't yet know, what do I do different? What do I, because the neurons are firing this way, what do I say to my client? Yeah. And um, let me give you an example of what I haven't been impressed with. Um, when I've asked that question to some of the neuroscience people, one of the findings is, well, the brain is really calibrated toward uh, being able to change a lot better if everything is, is, is risk, is, if risk is low and everything's calm and and there's no risk, there, there's no negative consequences to learning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and well, that's great, but the, the environments I work in, billions of dollars are at stake. Yeah. The, the CEO's job is on the line. Yeah. The board is all upset. Yeah. This is, people have their neck stuck out. So it, inherent in it is tension. Yeah. And so I'm looking, and I, and I believe that neuroscience will continue to advance. So I think it's just early days. Yeah. But I think out of that, Dean, that's an example. I think we're going to learn about, I don't know what technique you and I might do 20 years from now, from that, but I think there's some actual, not just understanding the brain, but actually we would introduce yeah. change differently. Um, and not just differently waiting for everybody to be calm and happy campers, but to actually introduce it in the midst of, of chaos and pressure. Yeah. So I'm, that's one thing I'm looking for. I'm re can, can I share yeah. just a thought about that? Because I think that's really intriguing. Because here's, a, for, for me, a way of seeing what you're describing. And I'll just, I'll, I'll draw from, you know, the being first approach, because it's what I'm most familiar with. You know, central to our leadership work is that we teach leaders how to uh, turn inward and navigate their own interior. And so one of the core tools around that is the use of breath in a certain way because what we know neurologically is that if you can learn to surrender at the very end of your exhale, mm -hmm. it shifts mm -hmm. your nervous system. Hormones secrete differently, blood flows differently, etc. When I think of the neuroscience, is that doesn't change the technique, but the neuroscience is validating that. Yes. Right? Yes. So now if I can find a place of calm in me, then my brain is more malleable to what the environment is asking of me. So my behavior change is more available to me. I, I can adopt change of behavior more readily if I can get that calm place. So my assumption going forward with the neuroscience is that it's not maybe even going to be teaching us new tools and techniques, what do we do with it, but it's going to be validating things that we might already be I doing. I totally agree with you. I actually think it already is. To yes. your, that's a great example. It already is it's, it's validating all kinds of things that just intuitively was, mm -hmm. has been working for us for a long time and now there's evidence of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally with you there. My sense is though, that we're actually gonna get some breakthrough yes. things to think about and do that we never have. Yes. Uh, um, if it did nothing but validate, that would be worth the journey it from my be. standpoint. And, and, and uh, I'm glad you reminded me of, of, of just what you did because, because finding uh, it's one thing to say, well, uh, we need to find a safe way for everybody to deal with risky change. And I, I'm not so sure we're going to get there. Yeah. But finding a calm center in the middle of the turmoil, yes. that's a different issue, that right? Is, and that's, that's, that's where your work yeah. takes. Yeah. That, I'm looking, I'm looking for, out of that discipline, m m more assistance in, in yeah. that. Definitely validation. Yeah. I absolutely think that's going to come. Well, I think what's interesting to me is when I think about the conversation 40 years with the go with leaders, right? It was it was this big in terms of the big giant bandwidth of what change really is about. And um, even today, you, you know, I've run into prospective clients all the time who have too small of a worldview to see the order and the strategy 
of which to deal with this complex chaos that they're dealing with in their organization, right? Their worldview is too small. And so it's interesting to me when I think of the neuro neuroscience is I think it takes that metaphorically left brain scientific approach to help convince those leaders to actually begin to look outside the box. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I think that, you know, like any early adopter field, you know, there's often a, either a runway or an explosion, um, you know, coming into the, the new domain. And I think this is going to be a runway into a possibility. And it sounds like you're seeing the same thing. I mean, the first three or four years, not, not the big explosion of the big aha. Yeah, but, but I haven't given up on it. I, um, um, and I'm, you know, I'm not in that community, so I'm, I'm kind of waiting. <laughs> But I, but I have faith in that, that yeah. that community is going to generate some stuff. I don't think it's necessarily going to bring it to us change practitioners. We're going to have to be vigilant about watching for things that can be exported. Yeah. But I, I think that will happen. Like, I also am really taken with uh, not social media as much as the mindset mm -hmm. that social media uh, supports. Mm -hmm. And I don't associate it with simply the next generation, although it's clearly there. Um, th there's an evolution, I think, Dean, for us as practitioners that not that top-down legitimization of change is going to go away, not as long as you work in, in hierarchies, but it's complementary. Um, I wouldn't even say it's not ver top-down versus bottom-up. It's top-down versus community building. Mm -hmm. That's that that's a an emerging slant to our our work that I I hope will continue to evolve in the profession. Mm. Um, I uh, for a while I was concerned because the advocates of community building that I had exposure to were kind of in rebellion against yeah. hierarchy, and I I just I didn't see how that was going to work in the real world. But, but finding a synergistic partnership between these two and helping leaders understand that that's not their enemy, that it's a very different ally mm -hmm. than do what I tell you to, right. but it's not their enemy. Right. And the community builders, uh, the sharers of information, and we just use technology to do it, they're, I'm hoping that they don't feel like they have to kill the king mm -hmm. to make this work. I, I just have faith that there's some, there's some emerging synergistic dynamics that are going to come together. I think it's a whole, like neuroscience, I think that's a whole new emerging front, yes. if you will, to our work. Yeah, well, I think for me, the way I hear those and put those together is that I think what neuroscience is going to validate is the interior of the human. And as we get more interior, we're going to deal more with our ego issues, right? More our fears, yeah, doubts, anxieties. Sure the things that drive us to have power over and control of pe people. So the fundamental ego driver to staunch hierarchical behavior, power and control behavior in organizations is, is naturally going to evolve. It's going to lessen. And as people grow, they grow into a larger worldview. And that larger worldview takes more complexity and includes it, right? Because they can see the relationships and interdependencies. And I think that's where the breakthrough is. You know, leaders, and not that hierarchy is going to go away, but leaders waking up to the, the connectedness, right? The new holistic relationship of people working cross boundaries and having technology, but also face-to-face -face mediums to actually get together and converse across boundaries and share information and share resources, all in the context of what the organization is trying to achieve. And so that competition, bottom up, you know, top down, bottom up, will not work. Right? But the breakthrough to a more holistic worldview absolutely can. And, and that's, to me, the way to put it, is um, simply bringing these diverse perspectives together, I, I don't think is the answer. We, we actually have to help e each end of the continuum, but I'll pick on the leaders for a second. Leaders have to think differently yeah. in order to value differently. They can't just value differently. Um, a, a third uh, front that I'm interested in is, for, from a professional standpoint is I don't think we know enough about uh, the thinking process associated with, with managing complexity. Um, a consistent symptom 
I hear from, from clients is they're just overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and every day it gets more and more complex. And, and I think that we've, as practitioners, we've fallen behind in, in, in helping them understand, like how do we process complex information differently than, than more linear uh, relationships uh, between things. And it, what it leads to is, is when you manage complexity better, it's more of a holistic view, it's yeah. more inclusive. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that to me doesn't necessarily translate into democratic, by the way, but much more inclusive. And, and not for its own sake, I I'm not including other perspectives because it would, it's politically correct. I really value those other perspectives, exactly. which is what you what you were saying. Exactly. I think that that's a new frontier for us. I, I agree. As a profession, I agree. You know, Bob Keegan at Harvard wrote a great book called "You Know Over Our Heads." Yeah, or, you know, over great. our heads. And I mean, the idea is that um, when we know as practitioners, because we see it every day, leaders generally are over their heads. Yeah. The complexity of the world has gone further ahead than our general worldview to see that complexity in a way that we can navigate it forward, right? And changes that navigation, right? It's taking where we are today and bringing us to where, where we're going based on what the larger market or the environment, you know, is asking of us, right? Requiring the organization to evolve to, to, to compete. And the thing that's very interesting to me is that what we know about adult development is, is that as adults grow, they see across space and time with a greater, broader perspective. And the space thing is a whole system sinking right. idea, right? So we see systems in larger and larger holes so we can make more sense of the pieces and the parts and how they relate and how impacts over here will impact over there, or movements over here will impact over there. And then there's another view of process thinking. That's looking over time. And so we see with a longer range. You know, it's just not this month's project, right. but the quarter and the year and the five and the 10 year plan. And so the, what's beautiful about that is that the complexity of the world is actually requiring us to evolve, <laughs> to handle the complexity of the world. No, and then, let me just say one last little piece of that. So the, the third piece of what happens as, as people migrate up in their kind of world view is they're actually able to see more deeply into the human dynamic. And I think that's the tie back, the reason I want to spin this in there is I think it's the tie back to our earlier conversation around the neuroscience, is that as we're helping leaders grow, understand more complex thinking, valuing more diversity, getting deeper within themselves, that seems to be the path of growth that's needed in leaders and I think practitioners as well. Love to hear what you, what's your spin on that is. Um, yes to all that and, and I, I'd like to think that our profession is on the cusp of, the, the way you said it I think is, has been historically true We've basically relied on tenure. You know, if you live long enough, you'll, you know, you're not guaranteed to expand, but you got a better chance right. at expansive thinking at 60 than you did at 16. My hope is that that we can better understand what what took place in those intervening years mm -hmm. and try to bring that forward mm -hmm. so that you don't have to wait to be 60 to gain a perspective of a longer range. Yeah. Now, I understand from a neurological standpoint, some of that's fighting against chemistry and genetics and all that. So it's not like I, I think we can have wise 10-year-olds. You mean there's not a simulation we could run? <laughs> I don't think run? so. <laughs> Maybe, but probably not. But I, I suspect we don't have to be hit or miss. Yeah. Uh, a, hope you live that long. B, hope you learn. Yeah. I suspect that we can probably not in any way control, but nudge. Yeah. Some of these things to flourish earlier, yeah. um, you know. It, it, as it is, I think you and I probably, I know for myself, I I kind of wait until that readiness is there, and I and I know to some degree that's always there. I'm not really doing anything to foster its readiness as yeah. much as I'm trying to exploit it when it's ready. Yeah. I'd love it if our profession could actually accelerate waking up, yeah. waking up earlier. Yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, it's not unusual for a client to say, oh, if, any, if I just had had this, yeah. whatever, you know, whatever, we're, if I just had had this 10 or 15 years ago, and, and now the reality is um, they weren't ready 10 or 15 years ago. So, so yes, as a profession, we need to be attentive and certainly 
bring to bear whatever we can when that readiness is there. I'd like to think that we could have some impact on the readiness itself. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a, I can't resist the opportunity to, to make this mention, and that is, you know, the whole leadership breakthrough walk the talk to change program that we do when we start up a change effort. <clears throat> and often gets cascaded, you know, in various depths, you know, depths in the organization. Sometimes rather extensively. It's designed specifically for yeah. wake up. And he here's part of the secret sauce I can share from that design, is that we touch on the individual level, relationship level, team, and organizational level. And what we look at through experiential exercises, very much geared towards adult learning, right? Not lectures, but experiential exercises is what I'll call a golden thread of the human dynamic as it plays out in those. And fundamentally what it is, is revealing the ego dynamic of creating boundaries and resistance that acts out and then fight and flight, as opposed to a, what we'll call a being-based um, dynamic where I blend in or I include. So at the, at the personal level, it might be coming up against my fear and noticing my ego fights that fear, rather than the being-based where I surrender at the end of my exhale and I include the fear. Right, that's the door to breakthrough. In relationship, it might be you saying one thing, I have disagree and I push on your idea, as opposed to being able to stay centered at the end of my breath and notice my ego want to push against your idea, but instead open the space, so to speak, and invite your idea out. So that's an active listening move, but it connects us rather than separates us. Just like in the ego thing, I can separate and fight my fears or I can embrace my fears. When I do the embracing, something changes. And I can keep, you know, talk that same dynamic through at the team and the organizational level. But if we just spin to the organization, it's like dealing with resistance in the stakeholder group. The best way to deal with resistance is you go asking what's meaningful for them and sure. you listen, right? So it's that inclusion. And so you can see in that model is that that dyna human dynamic of opening rather than closing, just fundamentally, if we just want to get really simple for a moment, that's a human dynamic that plays through at all levels of scale from individual to to organizational. And that then, right there, exploring that for three or four days in various ways, has people have an aha of a different way of, so, of being. So let's it, let's talk about the aha moment, yeah. if it's okay. Um, that's what I meant by the distinction between being vigilant and even facilitating about the ahas versus actually trying to um, push it back so it's earlier. Yes. Here, here's where I'm going. Um, I don't. I don't think I. I think all I do in my work is exploit predisposition. Ah. I don't think I create. Oh yeah, wonderful. That's a great way to. So so my yeah. question is to me that three day event, yeah. or or anything I might do with mine it to the. To the untrained eye, I think it looks like what we did woke them up. Yes. From my experience, there was already a predisposition for waking up. Absolutely. Because the guy sitting right next to him, he went through the three days, he didn't wake up, right? So to me, it's not the experience. Yes, we have to do a good job with experience, but it's the predisposition. And what I'm curious about is if you and I have learned something about facilitating that predisposition, that's yes. great. Is there anything to promote the predisposition? Yes. That's what I'm curious about. Because I, I feel like all I do is exploit what's there. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. And I, I don't know that there's an answer to it, but um, back when I, when I was doing uh, marriage counseling, I, I always thought, you know, if, if, if the couple comes with the right frame of reference, it didn't matter what I said. It yeah. literally, I, hey, go home, study the phone book, uh -huh. bring me an answer. Yeah. They would find it an because yeah. their predisposition was yeah. there. On the flip side, you know, the, the best technique in the world doesn't work sometimes. Yes. So I'm curious, where are you with that? Do you, do you feel like you create that predisposition or you no, I'm, exploit it? I'm, you, I'm you, completely aligned with okay. where you are. For me, it's, <clears throat> I would call it stalking their edge. And every yeah. person has an edge. And so if we think of a levels of development model, right, just like, you know, Piaget helped us understand that kids go through stages of development. Well, adults don't stop yeah. that. Most do. Research shows about 80% stop because to keep going once you get out of public education or out of your education experience and the social structures that we have for kids growing up to be 18 or 20 and they leave the home, there's generally no more learning that takes place that helps them advance. 
but about 20% of the population actually does do the work, which is to turn inward and start to wonder who they are. What are they here for? What's their purpose? And those larger questions have them go deeper into, into their own self, which then, of course, is a growth process. Well, what we know, though, at those various stages, there's the next stage above. And so stocking their edge always comes from helping them identify where they are and what's the next stage above. And what's really wonderful now from a vertical development perspective of helping adults, leaders, consultants, et cetera, we're all adults too, um, continue to develop is that we can know where that edge is. And so that's a, you know, a really powerful way to then interfacing either with consultants and helping them develop you know, themselves so they can have a more you know, broader worldview, a deeper worldview so they can understand more of the complexity or leaders especially because their world is ultimately hugely complex and trying to navigate the 21st century reality. Yeah. And so if we can spot where they are, then we can know how to interface with them in a way that what our offering is, is graspable, right? If, if they're operating here and we're bringing this kind of solution, then we're just in la-la land to their world. Definitely that. I also think, though, that even the next step up is not within, that there, there, there are, there, I don't know what all the contributing factors are, but I think that there are ceilings. Mm -hmm. So if there's six stages and you identify that I'm at five, mm -hmm. helping me see six doesn't necessarily mean I've got a predisposition for six. Um, I don't think, I yeah. don't think. And so one of the things that to me is important is to not only make, make those doorways visible mm -hmm. for those with a predisposition, but make it face saving not to go through it. It's yeah. not like you're, something's wrong with you if you don't go to six Absolutely. or seven. Because my experience is that, uh, that some people get, they get stuck in that. They do that get stuck it's, in that. Oh, there's seven levels and I'm only at five. And I'm so bad, I'll never make it. And this must be not valid because I'm perfect the way I am. And the story is. as practitioners, I think we inadvertently promote that because we believe in our seven levels, yeah. right, whatever. And, and instead of, for me, it's about, it's about maximizing the level that you're at, yeah. stretching to pass that edge if at all yeah. possible, but you, know, you pass the edge, you're taking risk, yes. you may or may not want to take, um, and I just, personally, I don't, I don't want to set it up so there's a pejorative if people don't. Yes. But I want to open the door mm -hmm. to say, look, there's another level here. There's even guidance about how to get through it. Yeah. And, and to me, the, the question to them about, like, if, if, if you were guiding me through this process and you said, well, and I, and I asked you, I said, well, so, Dean, how do I know if I'm ready? Yes. Um, I think the guidance is, well, don't wait until it looks easy because yeah. that ain't going to happen. But if you can't not go through the door, yes. then you probably need to go through the Absolutely. door, right? <laughs> if you can actually know of the door and choose yes. not to, that's important to pay attention to. Yes. And I, I went through a period, I, I guess what I'm sharing with you is I went through a period where I, I think I was pejorative about that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I ever said it to clients, but I think I yeah, kind of had this, this, in, yeah, right? this vibe that, you know, yeah. oh, you know something. And I, that's not, that's not how I view it anymore. Yeah, that's awesome. See, I, for me, that's a stage of sign of growth, Daryl, right? Because <laughs> I think it is when we let go of judgment. Because the bottom line is, it's not a right or wrong, better than, worse than. It's simply the natural growth process. And so we can, we can engage with, you know, clients, people we're trying to support and never talk about levels. But what we talk about is what's meaningful to you. What are you aspiring to, right? And that, by definition, has them look up. And it's that ground, that anchoring of I'm aspiring to this. And then the fundamental question, well, what's in the way? You know, where, what are the barriers in your own style, your own emotional patterns, your own belief systems? Where do you see those, you know, derailing you to be able to live your aspiration? And now you have the accelerator and the brake. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, well, let's keep nurturing the accelerator, start unraveling and letting go of the baggage, the brake. And that's, I, I think, the, the fundamental structure to then help people grow. It doesn't matter what stage they're in and where they're going next. Just those that those two fundamental inquiries open the door for them, right? Because yeah. now they know the personal change work to do on both sides of the equation. Well, that strikes for me the whole work around immunity to change. Mm. How we've, mm -hmm. we've we've 
we've built in these mechanisms that inhibit yes. the movement forward. Yes. And, uh, and identifying what those are really yeah. important. Yeah. I'm curious how this conversation plays um, to something I know is really a, a, a passion of yours, um, which is developing practitioners. What do you see the next steps are for practitioners in really developing their ability to support leaders in the complexity? And I know that conversation immediately puts us on the kind of a, an edge where we're talking about practitioners that can support leaders as opposed to maybe uh, more rudimentary uh, baseline change management specialists. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about those folks. I'm talking about the people that are more in a senior position or wanting to get there. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I guess we could start with that distinction. I, um, there, there's a baseline of just technical competency about doing the work that um, n not only is it necessary to have that as a foundation, I think that that's, it's perfectly fine for that to be the pro one person's interpretation of the profession. Or, or not the profession, hopefully that's wider, but of their career. Mm -hmm. um, as you move into more senior level roles, you, you and I have the, the good fortune of getting to spend a lot of time with CEOs and, and that, that at, people at that altitude of their organization. And it requires, I think, a, a different level of trusted advisor relationship. Mm. That's how I view it. I think, I think a trusted advisor can certainly be played out on the shop floor. But there's a different um, sophistication to it, I guess I would say, when you're dealing with somebody with, with hundreds of thousands of people working for them mm -hmm. and billions of dollars in the, in, at risk in certain uh, certain situations. And the difference has very little to do with the techniques or the tools. I don't know that there needs to be a whole lot of difference between what we would do with a shop foreman and a CEO, technically. But, but how we show up, I think, is completely different because that leader, it's rare for that leader to have a deep, trusting relationship with anybody, inside or outside, uh, even more so with an outside consultant. And, um, and, so, and yet there's, there's certain space that you just can't develop together without that level of trust. And that trust is not going to come if you're not grounded yeah. well enough. They're not, they're not asking you to be grounded, they're just asking for help, mm -hmm. but it's not going to happen if you don't have a center of gravity that's pretty clear for yourself. And so for me, that gets translated into char character and presence. The, uh, I think of the character as, as the essence, if you take away all my facades and trappings, the essence of who I am, and it's such, such a personal phenomenon that Dean can't actually access my character. Dean accesses how I, how I reflect that character in the kind of presence I create. So I, there's a bubble around me and a bubble around you, and that's how people experience us. And it, it's a reflection of our character, but it's not our character. I, to me, that distinction is important because I, I don't think that we, I don't personally know how to relate to working on my character. I know how to reveal the character I have some of which, some of some of which is, you know, wonderful, and some of which is scary. That's who I am. My presence is what I can decide to do with that. Uh, so that distinction is important for me. Now, from then, if you think of that as if I actually was in touch with my character, not not the Daryl that I have been taught to be, so that I could please a client, but who I actually am. And I authentically express that through a presence. Now the question is, is there a client that would buy that package instead of the package Daryl's trying to pretend to be to get the business? So that the optimum linkage here is character presence and clients who would value that. So you actually get paid for being who you really are. Yeah. That to me is a direct link to what you've been saying in your work, what you and I are talking about here. Over the last few years, I've just gotten 
less and less intrigued with creating the next tool or technique, and, and, and in part because I've been doing that for so long, but in part because there's, there's so many people now doing really good, <laughs> there's all kind of new tools and techniques. So it, it's like as a profession, that's not a missing component anymore. Where I don't see enough work, in my opinion, is in helping practitioners show up whatever tools or techniques they use, it matters less. You have to have one, but, but what do you bring as, what is your, the essence of who you are and how does that get manifested through those tools and, and techniques? That work, I, I think is, professionally, we don't have a lot of places to go do that kind of work. Um, and and I, that's one of the things I think you and I have in common, though, though we've come at it totally separate. That's that space we both, it's important to our work, but I think we both have an investment in the profession's development yeah. to move in that direction. My fear is I see our profession as not just an entrepreneurial opportunity. I think we have, we're uniquely positioned to actually make a difference. And personally, I don't have a gift for figuring out what to change, but I do have some facility for helping to implement. My worst fear is that as a profession, a really important change that matters is going to surface. And, and the leader of that change that would affect the quality of life for our grandchildren, okay, really an important change, turns to one of us as a practitioner and says, I know I need change help. Would you come partner with me? And all I show up with is tools and techniques. Yes. <laughs> that scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Because it's not going to work. Yeah, That's absolutely. what scares me. It, yeah. It's not going to work. So, so I see it as professionally to get ready for changes that really matter. We got to be we got to be relentless about our tools and technique development, and we've got to turn inside and figure out who am I, how am I showing up, and who do I partner with? Because because the essence of Daryl and the presence that I authentically project, that's not a good partner for a lot of people. Yes. So I've got to be attentive to who I am and it, because if that guy has got a wonderful change but I'm not the right, he needs to call Dean or, or somebody because he needs help, right? Yeah. I don't feel professionally like we're, we're investing ourselves as much as I would like to see in that work. Yeah, wow. Well, you just spun up a really big world for us to jump into. I really appreciate that. And of course, you know the essence of the name of our company, Being First, right. like what you're being first. So you're opening the door to what feels like home. Yeah. So thank you very much. I, I want to make a couple comments because I'd I love to keep investigating this with you. Is that when you talk about character and presence and you know that, that change that matters showing up and then, and then the practitioners show up just with a toolbox, um, what that means inherently is presence and character actually make a difference, the, has the, impact. They're an intervention in themselves. Exactly. Who you are is exactly. an intervention. Yeah. And so it's not just that, well, then you like me more, it feels good being around me, right. but there's something I bring in that authenticity, yeah. in that connection to my own being. And what I'll suggest is that as people turn in and do that inner work around their own character and presence, they evolve themselves, yeah, right? And they begin to let go of the, the d parts of their own ego that are dysfunctional, right? Fears that don't serve them, anxieties, doubts, nervousness, etc. And those things are all, of course, things that keep them thinking smaller than they could. And so there's this natural relationship between as I let go of those fears in my own self, because I'm doing the inner work, then I become broader in my worldview. I become more holistic. I see bigger holes, if you will, across space and time, and I'm more in touch with the depth of me. And in, in the impact that I bring with that newfound, more authentic character and presence is that I'm actually operating from a higher perspective, a deeper worldview, if you will, that does see more order in the chaos. So the impact that it brings to my client is I'm actually a better advisor because I'm able to see what they can't see. You're, I'm able you're to, able to see it, Dean, but you're also willing to say it. Exactly. <laughs> And that's, that's the point of the letting go of the ego's fears, because now I'm able to ask the questions that are the bigger questions, that by them pondering the question, they begin to solve their own complexity issues and challenges, because they know the content, right? We don't know the content. We're just there as facilitators of, of change and of development. And in that 
level of being connected to my own authentic self and not attached to looking good, getting the answer right, them liking me, but just showing up, right, in, in my wholeness and being comfortable in my own being, then I am able to speak the truth I, I see. I am able to ask the tough, the tough questions. I'm able to ponder the, 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 the conflicts and hold the polarities between the tensions of what they might be wrestling with and getting sucked into the anxiety about it. But we're able to be there in a neutral holding tank, if you will, for them to be able to be more effective within their own thought process. Uh, yes to all that. Here's a caveat for, for me that may or may not be true for you. Um, yes to all that as potential. But, but the, the secret to the sauce to me is not my authenticity. My authenticity brings out what I actually am seeing, and I'm going to say it boldly. Mm -hmm. that's, my, that's what authenticity does. Now the issue is, do you as the client value what I saw? Yes. See, I could be very authentic, and it's just not helpful for you, yeah. whatever it is I'm seeing, right? So I'm, I'm at a place where, where my authenticity is primarily for me. And the, I'm not sure, I, I'm in service to the client, but I'm mostly living my life as I need to live it. That's why the issue is, if, I've, if I'm at that place, I need to be with clients who would value Daryl being Daryl. Yeah. They would value the, his insights, yeah. not just that he's authentic. So I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a, a meaningful distinction for you or not, but I, I've learned to be careful for me that it's not authenticity. They might, they might like my directness, but that's not the value. It's, the, it's what my authenticity brings forward. Because without the authenticity, I'm sitting here going, well, what could I say to make sure that I get this contract? You know, what can I say to make sure the, 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 the CEO doesn't get upset? That's what's going on mm -hmm. if I'm not being authentic, right? Yeah. Well, if I am authentic and I say, look, the bottom line is you're going to have to deal with, with this person that you've been dodging for three years to make this thing work. Now... The real issue is, is there value in that? Not value in my authenticity, but value in what my authenticity brought forward. Does that distinction make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. I want to pick it apart a little bit more. Is that for me, the value is in the truthfulness that you're sharing. Now, what that potential client or prospect might do with that, that's a whole other dimension. Got right? it. Okay. And that makes sense. So, so, so for me, it's like, well, I, I can easily separate those two things. There's impact and relationship between them, but the possibility of them you know, saying thank you very much, Daryl, there's the door, that's a so what to the authentic self. Absolutely. Right? The other piece is, is that when I'm operating in my highest state, because that's what we're talking about, right? the, the, the highest state I can muster, my own authentic being and, and be cent centered in my own self, is that I'm also the most inclusive. So there's a way in which I'm sensitive to how I say it, the way in which I say it, the words I use, et cetera. Absolutely. In a way that has the greatest potential impact, but it has nothing to do with the attachment to, I want, I want to right. make sure they like me, right? And so there's both, both kind of dances here. One is my authentic self, the other is the impact on them. And then the net of it all is, is that there is an attention for me always in of being the, in the greatest service so that I can deliver the message in a way that has the greatest probability of positive impact. And then if it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a so what. And then if, if it is that the client says, you know, I don't think this is going to fit between the two of us, I want to know that as soon as possible because i got other things to do. Right? But that's not, then I go to the next client, change my, my expression to make it more ego-based and less authentic just because I want that work. That's, that's migrating down to a lower part of myself rather than operating from the higher part of myself that I aspire to. Uh, there's, there's an aspect of this, I, I mentioned it earlier, that I'd like to loop back around to. I think that this uh, interior work is, I don't know that, it's re, that it uh, is only pursued, I guess, in fact, I guess I don't think it's only pursued to, for people, with people that aspire to mastery in right. whatever their craft is. But I think there's a high correlation. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, back to where's our profession going, I, I don't know that the profession is aspiring to mastery yeah. as much as it is to proficiency. Yes. And um, because, uh, because this work is, is not easy. And if you, uh, with, with mastery, you're, you're not pursuing an end state. You're pursuing the journey, right? Yes. 
And so without that mindset, I think it's difficult to sustain what you are. Maybe, okay, maybe a weekend workshop or whatever, but to live your life that way, I, I think it's pretty much tied to choosing, and it doesn't have to be change. It could be a plumber. It doesn't matter what it is. But, but I'm, going to, I'm going to commit my life to this. And, and so the first stage, well, there's apprenticeship, okay, and, and, and then after an apprenticeship, but, but even with apprenticeship, you're, when you're an apprentice, you're usually learning techniques mm -hmm. and tools. And then when you move to that journeyman, that's the cusp where you can either stay on that level or you can move to, to mastery. And I, I, I would like to see our profession talk more about there's a mastery option. Mm -hmm. Not that everybody should pursue it or be pushed, certainly be pushed into it. But I'm not even sure that a lot of the younger practitioners even see it as an option. Yeah. They, there, there's not a lot of models for them no. to look to. There's not. And the distinction for me is that, I mean, we talk about this in, you know, when we do this leadership retreat. We call it both doing-centered mastery and being-centered mastery. And both, beautifully, end up in the same place. Sure. And that is the shift from the outer to the inner. So it doesn't matter what I'm pursuing. You know, if I'm trying to be a better communicator, there's always two polarities I have to work, right? In any task, there's always two polarities. If I want to be a better parent, I'm going to be a better disciplinarian, but I better be a really good nurturer too. And if I'm really good on one side, not the other, then I'm not a masterful parent. I got to have full flexibility between both. If I want to be a great speaker or communicator, I got to be really good at speaking and really good at listening. If I'm just doing one, not the other very well, I'm not masterful. And what ends up happening with all humans and all tasks is we orient to our strength, which means there's a lot of situations we get in where we should be using our weakness. So I should be nurturing rather disciplining right now. But what happens is, is there's an ego voice that says, yeah, but if you go nurture, then they're going to think that they can always get away with this. And so the ego keeps moving me always towards overplaying my strength. And what's happening is that there's an ego fear I'm not addressing. Well, I just went from external to internal. If I want to be really good as a golfer, go there where it's really simply, it's an external thing. And I'm really good with the long ball, but I'm not so good with putting. I find myself going to the driving range to practice all the time and never to the putting green. It's the same thing as I don't want to look bad because I don't putt very well. So I stay away from the putting green. To be a better golfer, I got to turn into that fear. Turn into right? the I gotta negative. I got to turn yeah. into the negative. Yeah. I got, and that's inside myself. So. As soon as you have the mastery conversation, it inevitably, instantly raises the conversation. And where it goes is from the external doing to the inside being, right? So, so any task breaks down that way, is mastery is always the pursuit of what's going on in me so that I can then let go of those fears so I can operate in a flow state, right? Operate in the zone. I can be attentive to what's happening with the kids and know where to move. I have flexibility across the full dimension, right? I know when to speak. I know when to listen. And it's, it's wonderful to hear you talk about practitioners as they start learning the trade, right? That's the external what you do. And then they get good at that. And then they kind of get stuck. Well, I got, I, you know, I, I'm good at it. I'm, I'm the journeyman. But inevitably, if you really open up, if we can open up the mastery conversation in our field, Wow, that's profound because that's the turning inward that's the launch pad and, for real and, greatness. And Joseph Campbell gave us the, the roadmap, Absolutely. right? I mean, there's an actual so journey, the journey and it, it gets replicated over and over and over again. But that's it's, right. it, you know, it's, it's that internal pursuit. Yeah, I, um, and again, it, however this is engaged professionally, there's something wrong if you don't pursue mastery. No, it's just that I, my, I actually I actually think that probably there's a lot of practitioners that that's not even that's not even an option that's been considered. No one's mm -hmm. ever talked about that right. as as something that they would um, aspire to. And you know, when my kids were young, I just wanted. To expose them, I just wanted them to know that there were some options. I'm, I'm fine with whatever, right. wherever you go, but but to not have a clue and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a, that, so that so that's you know coming back to your question about what, what do we aspire 
to for the for the profession. That's um, I, I don't think there's any chance of us as our profession stopping or even slowing down the creation of the next generation of tools and techniques. Mm -hmm. So I don't worry about that anymore. Yeah. Uh, I just it, it's not that I don't value it. It's just that we're, we're good there. Yes. Um, we got. I think we have a lot of ground to cover on the other side. Yeah, and for me, the where that nets out is that you know, like you say, we've got handled, and we'll keep developing the external applicate the, the external world's application of change stuff, right? Tools and method and technology, and and where I think the you know back to our earlier startup of, of this conversation is that as we've gotten larger as a field and we've stabilized the base of that field, in some ways the conversation in the field has dropped down to tools and techniques. And what I hear you saying is that we need to raise that back up in the pursuit of mastery. And what's interesting to me is that that pursuit does turn us inward, right? We've established that. It does have us focus on presence and character. And that's actually the authentic way of being with our clients that enables us to be that trusted advisor where we can help clients see the complexity they don't necessarily see readily and they don't necessarily have people to converse about it, but also deliver insight, ideas, challenges, questions, conflict, you know, in a container of authenticity where clients can actually have a dialogue they don't get to have. And so what that journey tells me is that it really is that journey to greater presence and greater character in the inner world that allows us to actually be more effective as change leaders. And then I can bring whatever tools out I bring, right? And have a context of the most meaning, the valid meaning, because the client is engaged in the highest conversation possible. You know, what that, what that strikes for me is that um, this, this work that we're doing internally, it, it um, I feel like that when I, when I in fact, I, I just had lunch with a, with a, a practitioner that we've certified. She's really, really good at mm -hmm. our stuff. But I was complimenting her on she's not, she hasn't simply absorbed um, both, both of what we do and who we are. She's absorbed mm -hmm. both. She's taken on the responsibility to transfer that to others. Mm, nice. So trans, whether it's transferred to a practitioner or to a leader, I don't think we're through with our work until they feel as compelled. As, I mean, we, yes. Dean, you and I don't just go do stuff. We 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 try to transfer, right? Yeah. So they're so they're self-contained. Yes. Oh, the I don't think that transfer work is complete until they feel responsible That's right. to go pass it on. Because because a CEO passing on his or her version of that responsibility is a pretty pretty, big pretty deal. powerful deal. Absolutely. Oh, uh, and that. Um, that's something else. I'm not sure that our profession talks about the responsibility mm -hmm. of transfer. Yes. It talks a little bit about the commercialization of okay. transfer. Yes, that's right. But not, not the obligation that we have. That's part of our contribution to humanity is we really could deal with some of these changes better. Yes. And, and you're going to be dealing with some of these changes when I'm not around. So it's best for you. To, and by the way, you need to you know, yes. carry that mantle yourself. Uh, I, I, my hope is that our profession will, will get really, in a sense, uh, more sober, yeah. more, um, yeah, I would say not more somber, but more accountable yeah. than, it, than it is in that respect. I, I, I don't mean, I don't think as a profession we take ourselves too seriously. Yes. And I, I would like for us to... Mm -hmm. To me, a physician takes himself or herself seriously. I, I got I to gotta show up in the operating room. Yeah, this life is dependent on me. It's not, well, let's just see what happens. And there's a, there's a little more looseness in our work than, than I would like to see. Yes. Well, well, the thing that you're bringing forth for me that's really powerful is this idea of transference, of the, of the accountability. And what I would insert in there, and you touched on this idea, I'm going to name it, is when, when a practitioner is able to bring their authenticity, right, their being to, to the client, there's a level of impact that we've discussed all the way down to the level of impact of the change intervention because we're able to 
discourse about more and more of the real challenges and get to deeper, bigger, more powerful solutions. But there's also the impact human to human. And when someone's operating from their being, it draws the others into a higher state of discourse, a higher state within themselves. Yes. And there's, there's fundamentally right there what I would call this growth into being conscious, to living a life that's conscious, which means I'm conscious that I'm uh, not just an external doing, but I've got an internal being as well, and that my mindset is causative. Right? What happens in here actually influences what happens out there. And when I wake up to that, you use that word wake up, when I wake up to that, it changes everything. A qualifier for me about this sense of waking up and transfer is the degree to which it's presented as a, an offering rather than, than a demand. Yeah, yeah. So we're not talking about missionaries no, 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 signing no, no, no. people up, right? It, it's just living your life in such a way that, that you're, you're intentionally making available something yeah. that, that if, again, if there's a predisposition, um, that that people may choose to, to to take advantage of it, but I I really um, a lot of people I'm sure this happens in your work a lot of practitioners that go through our stuff get they, they get a little too turned on yeah, right yes. and so they want to rush back and, and sign everybody up and um, it it's not just that it doesn't work it's actually antithetical yeah. to what to what we're talking about, that because uh, being it's not it's not I'm going to be authentic in order to have an, an impact on you. It's just that I'm going to live an authentic life, right? And the, and so so you signing up or not signing up is not uh, is not a validation that's right. needed. But that's right. uh, <laughs> for a lot of folks, they they kind of go through that period where where they got it. Well, well, Joseph Campbell articulated it so well when the when the hero comes home and says, I got it, I got it. I'm like, oh, yeah, well. <laughs> so the laundry's dirty. That's right. He said. Yeah. yeah. Well, Daryl, this has been fantastic oh, yeah, to talk cool. with you. Yeah. Awesome. Really, really Thank awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, any parting thoughts, comments that wraps, wraps a, a bow around this? Of course, as soon as you say something, we'll start riffing on something else. So <laughs> <laughs> um, like, what's your hope? What's your... What's your wish going forward as you leave your legacy, you know, all the work that you've done? Um, uh, before, I hope to live long enough to be embarrassed by my work. Mm. To, for people to take that and say, hey, thanks a lot, kid, but mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to get serious about it now. Yeah. And to just catapult. Uh, number one, there's that much room to, to go, but number two, the planet needs that much help. Yes. Uh, we're, I mean, relative to a few generations down the road, Dean, we are doing, you know, we're like, you know, we got sticks we're trying to create some yeah. fire here yeah. with. We, there's, there's so much that we don't know. And the pace of the complexity is, is outstripping whatever gains yeah. that we are making. So. That really would make me a happy camper if I could, uh, if I could feel like that, that because of some of the foundational work that you and I laid in place, the real serious stuff yeah. was able to take off. That would, that would make me feel very fulfilled. Well, I can um, say that when the world's in that state where they've taken the stick rubbing you've done for 40 years and turned it into that blazing fire, that's a really major progress because your sticking stick rubbing has been um, hugely progressive in its own way. So just the idea that Daryl Connor was the junior, I love that idea. It's like a great vision of the world's going to actually be well, a wonderful place. Well, I place. don't, I don't discount at all the stick rubbing. Yeah. I really do know. I know it's important, but it is. It, it can't be. It just can't be thought of as. You know, well, that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's so primitive. Absolutely. It's so incredibly primitive. Yeah. And uh, you know, the other wish I have is that more practitioners would have this kind of dialogue with each other. Mm -hmm. That there would be a whole library yeah. of of film yeah. around practitioners. Yeah. You know, doing their version, whatever. Yeah. 
yeah. whatever. I mean, you and I got our things, we get turned on. But there, you know, there's this bubble, the profession's in this bubble, and we could be pushing out on different aspects. Nobody's going to create some grand thing here. Yes. But if people could push out in the each zone and then, and then share it, yeah. um, you know, I mean, you do your right, you, we, we each work with clients, but we each write, we do films, and, and to me, I, hopefully they have value in themselves, but I like to, for other practitioners to go, well, I got something to say, say and, yeah. and I, got, I got a colleague that, you know, uh -huh. and then to share that, that, yeah. would, that would be really cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing yourself today, my friend. Thank you. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. So check Daryl out, Connor's Partners. His work is awesome, and I really, really appreciate your friendship.